hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon. Good to see everybody. Give a hand wave and maybe a shout out from where you are. So my name is Anissa. I'm with Parkinson and Movement Disorder Alliance. We're very excited for you to join us today for this topic. And apparently it's a very popular one. We have a lot of people register today. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to chat your questions. If you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you'll see the little chat box, you pop it up and you can ask your questions to the doctor today. And as I understand it, um, we're gonna actually try to answer your questions as we go along the topic today, just so that we kind of correlate the questions to what she's discussing as opposed to trying to go back through at the end and revisit some of those things. So I'll try to do my best to monitor that chat for you. It's just easier to do it that way because we have so many people joining us and it helps to reduce background noise as well. So thank you for joining us. So I want to welcome our speaker. This is Dr. Miri and she is a fellowship trained movement disorder specialist who's actually doing a fellowship training in neuro ophthalmology with the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute in the University of Miami in Florida. So this is a topic that I've been interested in getting a speaker on because I know a lot of people have asked about vision issues and Parkinson's and the role of neuro ophthalmology. And if you're familiar with our ecosystem, you know that in our, our medical network, we include specialties like neuro ophthalmology, but not everybody knows what that even means. Um, and what they can do and what the vision issues are in Parkinson's. So that is what Dr. Mary is going to enlighten us on today. So I'm very excited for that. So Dr. Mary, please um, join us today and share your expertise and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. This is uh, Shana Azmiri. I'm, uh, as Anissa said, I'm a movement disorder specialist and currently I'm getting a training in neurophthalmology because of uh, my interest in uh, this frequent uh, ophthalmic problem, eye problem in Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, so basically, uh, today we are going to go through uh, some of the most common eye issues, not necessarily neuroophthalmic issues, but some of them are neuroophthalmic and some of them are just general eye issues. And we're gonna uh, briefly discuss uh, those um, issues with some PowerPoint slides that I prepared. And again, as Anissa said, if you have any question in between, just feel free to ask and type in the chat, we'll answer. Okay, so I get it started here. So um, again, today's topic is about ocula or eye and visual disturbances in Parkinson's disease patients. And uh, I have no relevant disclosure to this presentation. And um, objective of this talk is first to just introduce some of the most common eye and visual problem patients with Parkinson's disease encounter and um, also to uh, just tell you about, uh, like give you some awareness to just er uh, for early recognition of these problems and uh, possible recommendation for evaluation, evaluation and management of these eye issues, just to improve patient's quality of life, independence and safety. Uh, Parkinson's disease, as everyone knows, uh, is a movement disorder and the underlying etiology is a neurodegenerative etiology uh, caused by dopaminergic loss in the central nervous system or peripheral nervous system, recently they say. And basic diagnostic criteria for this is bradykinesia, rest tremor, rigidity, and postural instability. But Parkinson's disease patients experience a lot of non-motor symptoms, which include a range of from anxiety, depression, constipation, fatigue, lightheadedness, as well as visual hallucination and vision problem. So Parkinson's disease patient, up to 80% of patients might experience 
one of this type of vision problem that we are going to discuss. So as you can see, is uh, pretty much common. So what are the vision problems in uh, Parkinson disease patients? First type of vision problem is age-related vision problem that is not a specific to Parkinson patient. It can happen in anyone after the age of say 40, 50. Uh, and the other vision problem are more specific to Parkinson patient. This type can happen in other people as well, but Parkinson patients are more prone and more susceptible to this kind of vision problem that we will discuss. So first let's go over just common age-related eye issues that anyone can experience this. First is perspiopia, which is aging of the eye. And that happened, uh, present as difficulty focusing, blurred vision, specifically in close distance, like uh, the age of onset is after the age of 40, probably people will experience that. And the reason for that is that if, if you consider this is an eyeball, this is, this is an eye, and this is, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not. Uh, so this is the front of the eye, if you can see the, my pointer. You can this, see it, it's good. Okay, perfect. And this is the back of the eye, uh, the optic nerve. So light goes in from the cornea, and this is your pupil, the hole in the middle of the iris, and then uh, it passes the lens, as you see here, this whitish uh, um, uh, thing is the lens. And then the light goes back to the retina. And then from there, you produce the visual image of things around you. And then it goes, the information goes from optic nerve back all the way back to the brain. So now what happens is presbyopia is that uh, the lens doesn't have that accommodative, um, uh, the accommodative properties as much. And then the light will focus in the back of the eye and not in the retina. And that can be corrected with a lens with like eyeglasses, reading eyeglasses. So that's a pretty common thing, but you should be aware of it and you know, just you know, having that corrected. Uh, with an optometrist uh, can help you to be more aware and more like active, read more. And uh, just that's like good for everyone to know about that. The next, um, the next problem is cataract. What is cataract? Uh, we discussed about the lens in front of the eye that will focus the light in the back of the eye, which is retina. So when cataract happens is that like there is a cloudiness inside the lens and that will prevent the light goes in. So if someone has like, uh, like, you know, there are different stages, mild, moderate, severe. So if someone has a severe cataract, the light really doesn't pass through the eye. And these people will have a lot of difficulty specifically at night because uh, if there is a dim light or if there is not enough light and they already have this cloudy lens, then they wouldn't be able to see well. And in a particular in Parkinson patient, they might get a little bit some uh, visual perception deficit um, with having cataract. Again, that's something to be aware of and have a regular eye exam just to see if you have that, if it is visually significant or not. And if it is visually significant, meaning that if it is like severe stage, then you will get cataract surgery, you will get better vision. And the other thing is glaucoma. What is glaucoma? So this is the eye again. And again, this is optic nerve. So glaucoma is increased pressure inside the eye. And the reason for that, the etiology of that is like really not well known. We just know that the pressure is increased and that will compress the optic nerve in the back of the eye. And, um, and that will cause nerve damage and gradually uh, vision loss. Again, it's, it's not that the studies doesn't show that this is more common in Parkinson or not. It's like equal, like any other people, like in general population. But again, it's something to be aware of because you wanna preserve the vision. And just with checking the eye, regular eye exam, your optometrist or ophthalmologist will know about that. 
And uh, the other problem is macular degeneration. Again, with aging, people get macular degeneration. And what, that, what is that? So we discussed about the light goes back of the eye in the macula focuses there, and then the, uh, the information will go to the optic nerve next to it. So what happens is that the people with macular degeneration get some degenerative changes. This is the back of the eye. When we get a fundus photo in the back of the eye, or when we look at the back of your eye, we see this. This is optic nerve, and this is the retina. This is the macula, and the light goes right there. So for these people who have macular degeneration, uh, there, there is some defect here in the center of vision and they will gradually get worse than in central vision. And they should see retina specialists. But again, a routine eye exam will help to detect that. And you know they will follow up with retina specialists and they will take care of that. Um, but again, this is not more common. If anything, actually they say, um, patients with Parkinson's disease has, have less of this issue, uh, is not that common in this patient. So, so basically, as you said, routine eye exam, at least annual eye exam is recommended. Now going to most common visual and ocular problem related to Parkinson's disease. So first, first category is external eye problem. Uh, external, I mean like in the surface of the eye. So dry eye is the most common problem in Parkinson patient. Uh, and that is mainly because of decreased blink rate that is proven that uh, people with Parkinson do not like blink like as normal people as other people who do not have Parkinson. And that causes like this tear uh, that is produced from your tear gland doesn't go throughout the surface of the eye and the eye gets dry and irritated. And sometimes if it is not taken, taken care of, it causes corneal damage. So you wanna prevent that. So if uh, we'll discuss about like all the symptoms, so that's one. Then uh, lacrimal gland dysfunction, Mabovian gland dysfunctions are other problems, other common problems. Blepharospasm, other common problems that involve the external part of the eye. We will discuss all of this in detail. The second category is eye movement abnormality. Uh, which uh, pre may present as double vision or diplopia. And it's very common in Parkinson patients to get diplopia. Between 10 to 38% pe of people will get that. And the third most common vision problem is depth perception deficit, depth perception problem, color vision, and contrast sensitivity problem. And at the end, most of you know about visual hallucination. That is also another common problem, which is in the category of uh, uh, vision abnormalities in Parkinson's disease patients. So dopamine, which is uh, reduced in the system for Parkinson patient, uh, is also um, uh, is very involved in the vision processing. So um, also the eye muscle control also is real. Dopamine is also related to ocular motor control of the eye, light adaptation, contrast sensitivity, color vision, all of this uh, dopamine in, plays, a, plays an important role in all of this. And lack of dopamine will cause visual disturbance in Parkinson patients. So let's go over dry eye syndrome. Symptoms of dry eye syndromes are just soreness, watery eye, red eye. And again, it happens in up to 18% of people. Like in general population, it happens maybe in 3%, but in Parkinson's patient up to 80, 18%. And as you see in here in the eye, lacrimal gland is like right above your eye and it will produce tear fluid, which will lubricate the surface of your eye. For some reason, the tear production is less, blink rate is less, so then that will cause just uh, dryness uh, in front of the eye, will cause irritation, and again, if not treated, will cause corneal damage. And, um, and here, you can see 
you know, at the tip of the eyelid also, there are some um, uh, Mabovian glands that produce some uh, material to tear, uh, to tear gland, uh, to, sorry, to tear fluid. And again, if they're clogged up, they will have some inflammation here and people who have this problem, they will also have more dry eyes. Actually, in people who have Mabovian uh, gland dysfunction, they will have up to, I think, over 50% will have dry eye as well. And um, yeah, up to 60% of those people. And again, uh, symptoms of dry eyes are burning, itching, tearing, gritty feeling sensation in the eye, and foreign body sensation, redness. And these people will have fluctuation and intermittent blurriness of vision when they blink and when they like uh, spread the uh, tear in front of their eyes, uh, then they temporarily feel better. But again, um, it goes back to blurry because again, they do not have enough tear in front of their eyes. And the reason for dry eyes can be a number of different things. Again, in Parkinson patient is because of infrequent uh, blinking and probably the dysfunction of the lacrimal gland. Um, but you know, people who have thyroid disease, people who have autoimmune disease like uh, lupus or Sjogren syndrome, uh, like some other uh, you know general systemic problems can also cause uh, dry eyes. So. Uh, the point is that not to blame everything on Parkinson and say, oh, I have dry eye, maybe this is because of Parkinson. No, first, you know, you should also, not you, but your doctor should also make sure that like there is no other reason, your thyroid function is good, like you don't have any eye inflammation, anything else causing that. And if everything else is normal, your doctor will check all that, then maybe we just call it eye, uh, dry eye because of Parkinson. And and the treatment for that will be definitely artificial tear will help. Artificial tears are over the counter. You can get it if you feel those sensations, you can use it like three to four times a day. And uh, you know some, some doctors will provide you with artificial tear gels and ointments, warm, warm compresses, and uh, some eye, uh, eyelash and eyelid scrubs may help. Again, better to be seen by a doctor just to make sure there is no infection because sometimes also it's like infectious etiology because uh, like underlying that. And again, making sure those are not the cause then usually uh, artificial tears will help um, in this case. Um, so can I ask a question and maybe you're going to address it, but someone had asked about um, for extreme dry eyes and diminished blinking, are plugs a benefit? Yes, those are also helpful. Yes, that's, that's some, some doctors recommend that and um, that can be helpful, yes. But you know, some other eye drops that doctors can prescribe like cyclosporin eye drop will sometimes help. Uh, again, those are prescri uh, prescription medication and an eye doctor can prescribe you that. But again, um, I was talking about just over the counter options. If you have extreme dry eyes that do not respond to artificial tears, you can get some prescription eye drops that would help you know, overall over time to reduce that dry eye. Now, if, if, if you have any question, again, you can feel free to uh, just uh, jump in, uh, but otherwise I, I'm gonna move on. So I'm next- to hear your, the questions to uh, when you're at the specific topic. So- Okay, got it. I'll just back because I know okay. you're probably going to be discussing them. So if we don't, then I'll go back and ask them. But I did thought I thought that one about the eye plugs were interesting. And somebody actually wrote in said that their wife had gotten plugs and it helped a lot. So um, and then one person did ask, is it necessary to use preservative free eye drops? I mean, preservative uh, free eye drops will help. And here we, we prescribe those. But again, 
you can start with just regular uh, artificial tears. If like some people have problem with those, then we'll tell them just to use preservative free artificial tears. So whichever works for you. And then someone asked about eyelash scrubs. Mm -hmm. Eyelashes and scrubs, you can like buy from Amazon. If you search Amazon, you can, you can find good ones and buy it. And what exactly do you, do you or have it? So they, uh, so for those who have may, may bone and uh, gland dysfunction, that they have a little bit uh, irritation over here uh, at the like margin of the eyelid like, and over here, they can, you know, uh, use that as scrub like very firmly, like three times a day to, you know, a little bit scrub it and, you know, wash it again. It would be very gentle, uh, but again, that will help opening up those like, you know, holes that are clogged. And again, not inside the eye, but rather at the tip of the um, eyelashes to just help a little bit those um, uh, clogged holes to just open and uh, continue normal function. And then one last question. Um, someone wanted to know a little bit more about what the plugs are. Actually, that one, I, I am not, I haven't worked with that, so I don't know the answer to that, but I have heard that people use it if the dry eye is like really um, intractable and they cannot treat it with like other options that they have. I myself, I haven't used it, so I'm not, I'm not familiar very well with that. Okay. All right. Well, I'll let you go on and then I will let you know when some questions correlate to what you're talking about. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, now blepharospasm. So you might know that um, that is also, you know, blepharospasm can happen without Parkinson, just, be, just by itself, isolated blepharospasm. But in patients with Parkinson, they also have like this spasm of the eyelids, frequent blinking, that like um, dystonia is a kind of dystonia of the eyelids. And usually it's both eyes uh, at the same time. And uh, for this, if some people, they have severe form of it that like the eyes both get so close and they have difficulty even opening it. So in those cases, we would definitely recommend uh, toxin, botulinum toxin injection, like those uh, eye muscles that will help to relax the eye muscles. And you know, after a few treatments, they will have their eyes like completely open and those spasm doesn't happen, but it's a kind of dystonia, like a patient with Parkinson will experience, you know, dystonia stiffness in the arms, legs, in the neck, similar thing happens around the eye muscle. So that's another thing that is like a toxin injection is like really great option for that. And we will get great results. And this is done by movement disorder and neuroophthalmologists both do that. Regular ophthalmologists usually do not do this, but neuroophthalmologists and movement disorder specialists, they do these injections. Now going to another most common problem in Parkinson is double vision. And up to between 10 to 38% of patients will experience double vision and it sometimes is very disabling and there are different mechanisms for this issue. Some people actually get double vision with their motor, uh, motor fluctuations. Uh, for example, in their up period, uh, their, their eye alignments, ocular alignments just change because of the dystonia of the eye muscle. And they get uh, a little bit blurry, diplopia, double vision. And then after taking uh, the, the cinnamon uh, or uh, levodopa dose that they are taking, they get better. So it's kind of fluctuating. So that's one reason. And the other most common reason is convergence insufficiency. We will discuss that. Uh, there is like there are other reasons like problems in the brain, or some people you know might have smaller stroke. Again, not to uh, like scare you, but that's another reason for diplopias, but those are usually sudden onset, like, you know, someone wakes up and they see, oh, I see double and like out of nowhere. So those are like goes with more stroke, 
but patients with Parkinson is just kind of blurry on and off double vision. So that's completely different. And we'll go over like why this is happening. So for, for double vision, it's very important to get the history. As I said, you know, you easily can mistaken that with a stroke or mistaken that with like other conditions that cause double, double vision. Even dry eye can cause double vision. Just, just simply, if your eyes is dry, sometimes you may see double and you blink a few times, then it's one. So, you know, different things can cause this and that's why history is very important. Um, and, and first basic question in double vision is, if you cover one eye and look with one eye, do you still see double or double vision goes away? Then cover the other eye. Do you see still double or not? So if double vision goes away with covering one eye and basically you just see double when you look with both eyes, then it is called binocular diplopia. Uh, meaning that diplopia with double vision with both eyes and when both eyes are open. And that's the most common type in Parkinson patient. If you see double only when one eye, for example, you covered one eye and with the other eye, you look at things and you see like, it's like you see double thing in front of you, then that is probably a problem uh, for your like the eye itself, it can be astigmatism, it can be some cornea problem, it can be from your uh, dry eye that causes like a little bit less tear in front of your eye, that tear film abnormality will cause that or someone who has like severe cataract or some people after cataract surgery might get just with one eye when you look at things like it's double. So this problem goes directly to ophthalmologists. So ophthalmologists will take care of that if you have that. But when you see double with both sides, we can describe more about what's happening there. So the other question is, when you see double, is it horizontal or vertical? Again, I'm talking about this description to make you aware that what physicians are looking for, you can tell them that, like what you have, and they will understand that better. So when you uh, see horizontally like one object in front of you double or do you see things vertically let me show you in this photo here for example this book on the top is like vertically double and this bottle of water is horizontally double so those are like different kind of diplopia with different kind of uh, etiology and sometimes it's actually diagonal um, and then next question is, is it like in your primary gaze when you look at straight, you get double or when you look from your side, left side or right side, when you look at things on your side, uh, you get double. Or some people might like tilt their head and with head tilted, they don't have any double vision, but when they straighten the head, there is a double vision. Other thing is that some people, they, they have they were born with a strabismus with this cross eyes. And you know, those, some of those might get also double vision. Other thing that's important is um, and like simple double vision shouldn't have pain. So if you have double vision and pain in the eye or in the head or in the back of the eye or something like that, that's something to just you know get the evaluation um, like more quickly. And uh, clinical course is also important, like about like, you know, if it is variable, some people might have all the time, constantly double, um, constantly see double. So that's different, uh, but some people have like intermittently double vision. Intermittent double vision is more common in Parkinson's disease, not like constant double vision. And, uh, you know, if there is any associated neurologic symptoms, again, if there is like a sudden onset double vision with like a really bad headache, you know, those are kind of things you should go to emergency room. But again, that's not common in part in some patients. Like we're talking about the common double vision problem. But, you know, as you know, those kind of uh, cases should go to emergency room. So now mechanism, as we discussed, just 
Some double vision in Parkinson is because of off period. Again, like muscle that gets stiff, the eye muscles also get stiff. So the eye alignment will change and the, the light that you get, the image that you get from each eye doesn't uh, focus, like doesn't overlap on, on each other. So that's why you see two things. But other most common thing is convergence insufficiency. I'm gonna discuss that in detail with you. Then uh, we talked about central, the brain problem, um, like things like, you know, all the stroke can do that. And um, the peripheral problem, but we are gonna discuss that in detail. So here at, at the place that I am at Baskin Palmar, uh, I just went over, we get a lot of Parkinson disease patients referred here for eye evaluation. Actually, most of them are here for double vision. And uh, so say out of 50 patients uh, that I, I evaluated uh, with diplopia, main complaint was diplopia. Some of them were constant, some of them were like intermittent. About 70% of them had convergence insufficiency and 18% of them had hypertropia. I'm gonna discuss that with you. And these are just simple ocular misalignment. And only maybe less than 10% had like maybe some history of like all the stroke or something like that, or some congenital like fourth nerve palsy or some other reason for that. But mainly it's just ocular misalignment that is causing this double vision. And what is convergence insufficiency? Look at the left image. When you look straight to read something or look at straight like at distance, it doesn't matter. Like we will say at close distance. Uh, both eyes get together and look at one center and get the image and like put that image together just to see the whole, to read the whole thing. But Patients with Parkinson, they had a little bit eye misalignment. So when they look at the straight in close distance, both eye do not look right at the same point. And that's why things a little bit might be blurry or doubled. And specifically this happens at distance. So that is what convergence insufficiency is. And again, inability to keep two eyes working together while uh, looking at the close distance. And uh, so one eye will a little bit like this eye, the right eye is a little bit turning outward. It's not like misaligned, they're not focusing at each word or at each object. And what is the management for this prism? But eyeglasses, did, this will be treated. And what we do is like a little bit of prism that will, like tilt the light or the like uh, whatever visual information comes comes into your eye and it will tilt that information so that you get the right focus and we do this measurement again optometrists can do that neuroophthalmologists can do that um, I'm not sure if regular ophthalmologists will uh, you know deal with that um, because you know, before you come with a conclusion that, oh, this is convergence insufficiency, you should have an eye exam to make sure there is no other reason. And you know, we'll come up with this conclusion after careful evaluation of eye movement and you know, in different direction, we use prism bars and we will measure this eye deviation. And then based on that examination, we'll come up with a conclusion that, okay, this is convergence insufficiency. And if that is, and as I said, it's very common and like at least over 70% of our cases had this. So you will give them prism, prism eyeglasses and, um, and that double vision will go away and they will feel much better when they look at the close distance. Uh, that will make them, uh, you know, happy to uh, like read better and to do like daily function better because it's really disabling problem. And so that was the double vision problem. Now there is another thing that is uh, another problem, vision problem is impaired depth perception. So when you wanna estimate the depth of like whatever image in front of you, 
both eyes should work together and uh, to get the, all the visual information uh, from like, you know, the environment around you to like, it's not, it's automatically calculated in your brain based on the visual information you get that uh, you can estimate the depth of like, for example, where are objects, where are different objects. And at different distances, again, two eyes should work together. Otherwise, if one eye doesn't work, then you will have error in estimation of uh, like distance, distance of object. For example, a normal eye uh, here, you see when you look at these two trees, uh, you see one of them more close and the other one far away. And again, based on the darkness, for example, if someone is like dark, it's like there is more shadow. So you just look at the close distance, but uh, you know, the visual input you get, brain automatically will calculate that and will, you know, give you the input automatically without knowing that, okay, that's like far away, this is closed system. This is a main problem for, this is one of the main problem for Parkinson's disease is that vision, the depth perception is not working as well. And that will cause some problems like, you know, tendency to fall and uh, Parkinson uh, patients already have a tendency to fall and imbalance, and if they cannot estimate the depth, that will be, you know, dangerous because it will increase the, you know, the fall risk and, uh, you know, some other damage. So, so again, it can be due to just eye movement abnormality, convergence abnormality, also sometimes like just the vision processing in the brain, if it is a slower, then, you know, it can also cause like depth perception problem. Uh, there was a study, recent study, and actually that was in Canada. They just recently published it last year. And in this study, they evaluated patients with freezing of gait. That is, uh, you know, uh, that one of the most disabling problems in Parkinson. And they found that in patients who have freezing of gait, actually the depth perception is also affected. So they have problem with this depth perception and they have also freezing of gait. Again, these patients should be, you know, getting evaluated, the eye movement, uh, you know, the eye alignment should be evaluated just to see if there is something to help, like prism eyeglasses, or if there is any other issue, or if there is any eye issue that can, you know, be corrected to get that uh, improvement of vision. But, you know, sometimes there is really no, specific reason that can be found, find, but just, you know, just making sure that those correctable reason are found and treated or managed, uh, that will be the ultimate goal. Dr. Mary, that makes me have a question. Yes. You know, a lot of times when people are dealing with freezing a gate, they'll use like lasers or other visual cues in order to break the freeze. So how is that impacted if they're having depth perception? So probably, you know, depth perception, again, th th there is not much a study in this field, but at least uh, a few studies that are out there show that uh, depth perception is impaired. And what that laser does is that focuses both eye to one point probably, and will, uh, you know, consciously make you aware of the, objects in front of you and probably that will improve like I, i'm not sure about the exact mechanism but that's what i suspect that just having your attention um, and your like vision like focus in one point and removing other distractions in your visual environment will help to you know uh, to go against the freezing of gate but this is not well studied and I, I'm not sure about the exact mechanism that how it helps, but I think uh, probably that that as a cue will uh, just help just overcoming this depth perception problem. And someone wrote in and wanted to know um, depth perception problems and the impact of using stairs. Using your stairs. I think, you know, uh, depth, uh, actually taking your stairs is a 
kind of automatic mechanism that you sometimes you don't even look at it like it's not it doesn't necessarily need your uh, visual input I think what happens with a stare is not the vision problem rather it is more your motor problem because you know just uh, sometimes you know people might get a like a freezing or you know uh, some some like probably a slowness in going up the stair is, I don't think that that is because of the uh, depth perception. But, uh, you know, uh, just again, finding the visual problem, for example, if going up a stair, you, you feel that like you cannot see well, uh, you know, and you know, the depth perception or contrast sensitivity that we are gonna discuss uh, later uh, in dark light is even worse so, you know, in those cases, you should just be cautious and like, just be aware of it and make your environment, you know, brighter so that, you know, even though that automatic reflex of, you know, noticing the depth and all that doesn't work, you at least help it with uh, external help with like bright light and all that to improve that um, um, kind of your activity to, to not to cause like limitation uh, considering its deficit. Great. I'll let you go on and we'll come back to some more questions. Okay, great. So now what is contrast sensitivity? Contrast sensitivity is the ability to differentiate object at low contrast, dim light, when, when there is like low contrast between two objects. We usually use this chart. Uh, to see if someone has contrast sensitivity or not. For example, the background of this chart is, you know, kind of bright, and these letters are grayish, but as it, as it, uh, it gets lighter gray, then for Parkinson patient, it gets more difficult to read, to differentiate that contrast. Again, that is kind of a uh, common one of the common problems in Parkinson patients. And it can happen again, it can happen in other people who have other conditions, but um, this is an issue uh, just because if someone has this contrast sensitivity, they should be more mindful and uh, more cautious at night when there is a dim light. Just, just having the self-awareness to uh, just uh, make the environment adjusted to this deficit. And again, uh, these people with this contrast sensitivity should have an eye exam, make sure it's not because of a retinal problem like uh, macular degeneration or other eye diseases. And for example, if the eye perfectly uh, looks normal, like the back of the eye, then, you know, we can just at the end say this is probably because of the Parkinson itself that this contrast sensitivity is impaired. And, um, and again, you know, sometimes it can affect driving, reading, navigation, just because if there is low light, it's going to make it very difficult. Um, and, um, and it's interesting that some recent studies say that this can be one of the first problems, first symptoms in Parkinson, even before the motor symptoms present. And this is even more common in patients with visual hallucinations. So uh, there are studies that show patients with Parkinson with visual hallucination compared to those without visual hallucination, they will get more contrast sensitivity and color vision deficit. And as you see, it's very common, 18 to 50% of Parkinson patients have this problem. And uh, the other topic is color vision, color vision abnormality, color vision discrimination. And, um, and again, this is also something that even years before uh, like Parkinson movement symptoms start, they will have this problem as well. And as you can see, we test this with this color chart. And in the left side, like for example, number 25, 29, 45, uh, 56, we can see this like this. And in the right side is when people who have color deficit, color vision deficit cannot see that number in the middle. So with that, we will test them and see if they can see those like color discrimination or not. 
but um, but again, this is more common in people with Lewy body dementia and those patients with uh, visual hallucinations. And, um, and the, there are some studies with like electrophysiology of the eye that show that this uh, shows that the retina itself, the retina, the back of the eye itself also has problem with Parkinson's disease. There is lack of dopamine and thinning of the retina. This is this topic that I'm going to tell you about is kind of in the research uh, area. Is not you know 100% uh, like say proven, but is like under research at this point. So basically, as we said, this is the back of your eye, optic nerve. You see it here, and this is macula. This is the center of vision. This is the center of color vision. And what happens is that you see the left and the right. This is, a, this is an image of the back of the eye. We get that with infrared imaging. Probably one of you might have had that in the past um, is a kind of color imaging of the eye. Retina specialists do that, neuroophthalmologists do that just to make sure the structure of the eye is good. So here in the left is a normal person. And as you can see, this is a normal structure. And the right one, you can see is like kind of thinner compared to this one. This one is thinner. And that is what happens in Parkinson. You know, it's not, it's not an obvious pathology. It's not like, you know, eye problem. It's just some minor changes uh, that can be detected. But at this point, it's just at the level of research. Is nothing to say, come and treat it or do anything. At this point, they are trying to use this as a marker for disease monitoring. For example, there are studies that they show if the retina is thinner, Parkinson motor symptoms are worse. And, uh, and again, this is something like brain MRI that they check like for progression of the disease, not, not in Parkinson, but in like things like MS or like other neurological disease. This is something that in the future they are trying to use as a marker, like in the back of the eye, just to see um, if they can use that as a marker. Like when they measure your motor score, your trim or all that, they can measure your eye as well. And uh, probably they attribute this to uh, this like vision problem in Parkinson. And, here you can see in the microscopy of the retina, the right, the left side is a normal retina. Um, and the right side, the middle one is a retina of, um, yeah, the middle one is a retina of patients with Lewy body disease. And the right side is a retina from Parkinson patient. And the, uh, the brown, the brownish, you know, material you see in the middle, those are dopamine neurons, dopaminergic neurons. And what happens is that, again, like brain, that they, they call this Parkinson, the, uh, the, the Parkinson is due to dopamine deficiency in the brain. You can see that in your eye, you also have dopamine. And, uh, you know, dopamine deficiency in the eye can, um, cause this like a slowness of like visual processing, you know, that color, you know, information is like maybe a little bit slower and that's why the color vision contrast is like difficult to discriminate. And there are studies that they show when patients with Parkinson take their levodopa and then they do some visual uh, testing, they do better. So on medication, they do better off medication. You know, it's like kind of fluctuating, which shows that dopamine also plays an important role here is uh, in, the, um, in the kind of visual processing. And here you can see, like, this is a schematic view of like the cells in the back of the eye. And, you know, these small cells, again, dopamine is like in between them, is a neurotransmitter in between them and help them to like exchange the information faster. So if there is less dopamine, the speed of those visual information processing and sending, sending it back through this optic nerve to the, like, to the brain to process that is slower. So 
uh, basically dopamine is also affecting the eye and because Parkinson is a dopamine deficiency disease, you know, that is also, the eye is not also uh, preserved, the eye is also somehow, but, but the good news is that is not a kind of uh, disease that causes any kind of, it's not a blinding disease that, you know, it's just some sort of visual function is slower. As I said, color vision is decreased, contrast sensitivity is decreased, but is not causing vision loss. Um, it's just rather some, some sort of functions of the vision is impaired. And visual hallucination, probably mm, your movement user specialists ask you most of the time about this. And as we, as you know, when I get the visual information, it send it back. So this is the MRI of the brain. And this part, like the top one is a normal, no, or, or a Parkinson patient without visual hallucination. And this is the, in front of the brain, this is the back of the brain and the back of the brain is the vision processing center. So in a Parkinson patient who does not have visual hallucination, you see that the brain function over here uh, with uh, uh, yellow uh, works well and the visual, visual cortex, vision part of the brain works well. But in the bottom one, this is the patient with visual hallucination, you see in the back, there is no activity. It's rather in the side of the brain, but, um, but there is not much activity in the back of the um, brain, which is the vision center. So that's why they attributed, like over the long time, they attributed visual hallucination because of Lewy body pathology in the back of the eye, in the, I'm sorry, in the back of the brain. Just uh, they attributed this to brain itself. However, recent studies show that not only the brain, but also the eye is also affected in patients with visual hallucination. Again, we, I showed you the retina and how dopamine affects the vision processing. So for some reason, uh, patients with uh, visual hallucination has more thinning of the retina in those color images that I showed you, they also get thinning of the retina. And now um, they say that probably um, we also should pay attention to eye as well. And again, this is um, right now at this time is like at the research level is not something routine. But again, if you have some vision problem, you always can you know, get eye examination just to make sure there is like really no other eye pathology, but probably this is something that in the future can help to guide treatment or to monitor, you know, Parkinson patient. Um, now, what is the conclusion of this talk? So the main conclusion is eye problem and visual problem is common in Parkinson patient. And uh, caregivers, patients, and clinicians should be aware of this uh, eye problems and eye changes, because if you are not aware, you're not gonna look for it. So if you're aware, then you will have, you will be mindful. If it happens, you will uh, some um, check up and you will just get um, just some evaluation. So those people who do not have any eye problem, then you, they should have their routine annual eye exam you know, eye check, pressure check, back of the eye check, everything check, just to make sure everything is normal. And, uh, you know, if there is something abnormal, collaboration between an optometrist, ophthalmologist, neuro-ophthalmologist, and a movement disorder specialist plays an important role. So they can help out with different things. So ba some basic things, uh, optometrists can, um, some, some like, you know, eyeglasses, and, you know, even prism measurements, some diplopia measurement, if it is due to simple reason, optometrists will handle that. But sometimes if it is complicated, then optometrists refer those patients either to neuro-ophthalmologists or to ophthalmologists. Sometimes if your movement disorder specialist thinks that 
you need a like neuroophthalmology exam, they will refer you to neuroophthalmology. And this is important to identify this problem because again, vision is very important. Improving vision is important by any means. And then uh, that will, you know, if there is a problem that can be fixed, then let's evaluate and fix it. And, um, or at least to be aware of it, that what is the issue so that you're mindful and you just adjust the environment based on what is happening. And uh, that will improve quality of life and rehabilitation and prevent, you know, the risk of falls and, you know, other complications. So this is extremely fascinating. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of questions. There's no way we're gonna be able to get through all of them and they're so good. I wanna go back to one of the early ones just to um, kind of tie in with your conclusion. And one of them is, you know, do you recommend someone see a neuro-ophthalmologist to, to establish any kind of a baseline even if they're not having symptoms? I don't think so. That's not necessary. You know, people who have, uh, so neuroophthalmologists see like people with, eye, with optic nerve problem, people who have elevated pressure in the brain, people with optic neuritis, like MS patients. So they see this like wide range of different patients, but I don't think that someone just to establish care with them would be necessary. But for for example, MS patients with history of vision loss, they will establish care with a neuroophthalmologist beside their MS doctor. But I don't think that a Parkinson patient doesn't need to establish care unless they have bellifer spasm, you know, that like twitching of the eyelid, they wanna do injection. Again, if their doctor doesn't do injection, they can get neuroophthalmologist. Or, you know, as I said, like other problems, like double vision, uh, but other problems like dry eyes, just a regular optometrist or a regular ophthalmologist is able to, like those external eye problem, ophthalmologist or optometrist can manage that. But if it is more like in the back of the eye at the level of retina or optic nerve or double vision, that uh, should come to us. And, um, you know, they can talk to their regular neurologist or, um, say um, their movement is a specialist, just tell them that and see what is their evaluation. If they see that is necessary, uh, they can refer them to us. So is there a way one can find a neuro-ophthalmologist? Several people have asked. I know that you know the International Movement Disorder Society has a way to find an MDS. So how do we find neuro-ophthalmologists? Right. So you go, there is a, like MDS, there is a, Society of North American Neuroophthalmologists. It's called NANOS. I can't give you the information, but basically, if we search Google for North American Neuroophthalmologist Society, they have a website and they have, uh, if you want to find a neuroophthalmologist, you go there and you search based on each state. You can find, like, for example, your state of California. You put that in and it will give you the list of all the neuroophthalmologists in that state and um, like their information and contact information. So you can find it there. All right. Uh, we have so many great um, questions that I don't even know where to go to. We only have a couple more minutes. Um, one person did ask, are there any exercises that can be done that would help any of these conditions? So there are like, there are some computer programs, like eye movement programs, computer programs. Um, you know, it's some studies shows that like it is helpful, like, you know, you do some eye exercises uh, that can help, but it's kind of controversial. Uh, so, I'm not 100% sure if there is a like 100% cure with the, or treatment with the, this kind of software. Um, but there are some of those out there and some of them, they show some data that they, like they work well. But again, I would say maybe first get evaluation to, to just see what is the problem and if for that a specific problem, if there is something to offer like some specific exercise or uh, activity to offer. But uh, 
at this point, there is no like proven guideline or anything like that to say. Right. Well, I'm going to um, ask you if you can stop sharing your screen. We are at the top of the hour. And one of the things that we like to do as we close out our programs is everybody being able to see each other and to wave and thank you for your fantastic presentation. This has been fascinating. Um, I think we're probably going to need to find a way to get some answers to all of these amazing questions that we, we did capture in our chat. So we'll have those um, and see if we can't find a way to get those answered for all of you today since we didn't get to go through all of them. But Dr. Mary, thank you so much for such an amazing presentation. I thank everybody for joining us. And if you would be willing to give her the wave of gratitude, just to let her know how much we appreciated her time. We thank you so much. We hope that you all have a wonderful afternoon and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Dr. Mary. Oh, sure. Definitely. Thank you. It was a pleasure for me. Right. Have a great day. You thank too. You. Bye, everyone. Bye.